Advanced work packaging for improved project performance. Creating safer, more efficient, and effective construction projects. This presentation was developed by Group ASI Inc. based in part on materials published by the Construction Industry Institute and the Construction Owners Association of Alberta. None of this content may be reproduced or distributed without express written consent. Introducing Lloyd Rankin, Project Management Professional. Lloyd is the president of Ascension Systems, or Group ASI, a world-leading and the world's first advanced work packaging and workface planning implementation support services and training company, serving the globe with a focus on the North American construction industry. Lloyd was the principal researcher in the development of the Construction Owners Association of Alberta WFP model and was a member of the International Committee responsible for development of advanced work packaging. Lloyd has spoken on the subject of advanced work packaging and workface planning in North America, Australia, China, Russia, and other places around the world. He's been a project management professional since 2002 and has over 20 years of project management experience. We encourage you to visit groupasi.com to learn more about our company and get involved in the professional AWP practitioners network in the AWP and WFP networking group on linkedin.com. And now here's Lloyd with AWP for improved project performance. Thanks and enjoy. Advanced work packaging was developed in Alberta initially, at least the, the work phase planning portion of it, and it was to address problems that uh, large oil and gas projects were having coming in on budget, on schedule, with uh, good quality. As a result, a uh, team was assembled of engineers, constructors, uh, procurement specialists, operations people, and we started looking at uh, what, what could we do to improve the performance of these projects. And we looked at, um, uh, we looked at turnarounds. Now turnarounds was where you shut down a facility and uh, uh, basically do repairs or changes to it and then start it up again and because you're losing production uh, there's a tendency to make sure that everything is extremely well organized that the materials and the equipment are all uh, taken care of so that uh, you hit your targets. One of the things that we found was that uh, you couldn't do that directly because the projects take uh, only maybe a couple of weeks to actually execute but they may be planned for two years so we had to modify the system to apply it to large construction projects but take some elements of learning from the uh, smaller turnaround projects. Uh, next slide. So. This is the agenda for today. We're going to talk a little bit about where AWP came from and the research that supports it. We're also going to talk about the theoretical model for advanced work packaging and we're going to walk through an example and uh, we're going to look at some of the elements of the model, uh, path of construction, interactive planning, work packaging and constraint satisfaction. We're also going to look at what types of projects it both can and uh, has been applied to and some of the major challenges in making advanced work packaging work. Uh, we've got really good documentation on the benefits that advanced work packaging can provide and then we're going to try and set aside a reasonable amount of time for you to ask your questions. So can I get you to change slides please? Okay, so uh, originally advanced work packaging was called work face planning and it was developed in Alberta by the Construction Owners Association. Um, as was said in the intro, uh, I was the researcher that helped them pull that uh, uh, portion of the research together. And basically from 2003 to 2006, the advanced work packaging uh, was limited to work phase planning and uh, a draft model was created in 2006. It was released to industry and after two years it was made into a Canadian best practice. Uh, 
the Americans through the Construction Industry Institute heard about advanced work packaging or that time work phase planning and spent two years studying it. Uh, they thought it was a very good process but uh, that it would be much better if we could expand the front end portion of it. So they approached the Construction Owners Association and a joint study was undertaken. Uh, there were some Canadians involved, mainly Americans. And another, uh, another number of years were spent building out the model. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we developed the model, we developed an implementation guide, uh, we developed a series of case studies, and we uh, did a validation to make sure that it actually worked and had benefit. Um, the reports that were issued were through RT272, there were three volumes, and there was also a validation study, which was RT319. Um, after all of this literature was reviewed and the work on the validation and the research was supported by the University of Texas at Austin, um, in 2015 uh, this was made a best practice. And I'll explain to you in a minute about what portion is work phase planning and what portion is advanced work packaging. Can I get you to change slides please? Okay, so when we talk about advanced work packaging, uh, I've talked about work phase planning and uh, I'm, I said that CII helped with the front end component, so that's the front end planning. Uh, this slide, which we call the surfboard slide, shows how the two connect. And um, if I could get you to just change slides, please. Initially, uh, we started with work phase planning, which is applying uh, very small packages, giving them to crews, making sure they have all the details necessary for them to uh, execute the work. And these, um, these activities are all taken on in the field when you're trying to execute and build the project. Now, one of the challenges we have is that decisions get made on the project very early as to how you're going to uh, work package it, uh, how the procurement is going to be done, how the uh, work is going to be engineered, and how that engineering is going to be delivered to the constructor. So one of the shortfalls of work phase planning was we found that many of the things that we needed to change in order to support the field, those decisions had been made some time earlier and it was too late to change them. Next slide, please. So that's where the, that's where the front end became so critical. We really needed to decide early on on the project how we were going to break the project down how we were going to get the stakeholders involved in order to improve alignment and also uh, how we were going to deliver the engineering, how we were going to deliver the procurement, how we were going to have operations involved in uh, decisions that were going to be made uh, throughout the life of the project. Next slide please. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an example and we're going to take some of the key elements of advanced work packaging and we're going to apply them so that you can see how it all fits together. And uh, the projects that we're talking about could be oil and gas, could be power, could be chemical, or could be large commercial projects like a hospital or uh, a hospital or a convention center or uh, other large commercial projects. Uh, next slide please. So the first thing we're going to talk about is path of construction and that's basically just how we're going to build it. What's the best way to do it? What are we going to do first? What are we going to do second? And if you think about it, if I was going to build something the first thing I would want to do is 
get a team together and decide, well, what do we need first? Uh, we may need roadways to get access to the site. Uh, we may need to have power so that we can actually run other portions of the project as we move through. But we want to assemble a team of constructors, engineers, procurement folks, operations folks, and determine what the best way to build this project is. Next slide. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have interactive planning sessions where we have all of these stakeholders get together and the main interactive planning sessions, not the only ones, but the main ones, would include path of construction, constructability reviews, uh, schedule development sessions, and issue resolution meetings. We've talked a little bit about the path of construction, but uh, constructability reviews, once we've decided how we're going to uh, execute the work, then we have to take a look and say, well, does that really make sense? Uh, so an example might be, I come up with a path of construction, I say this is how we're going to build it, and then as I start to look at it, I see that the way I'm building it is actually going to close off certain areas of the facility, and I'm not going to be able to gain access. Um, so that would require me to make some changes to make sure that the way I'm going to build it makes sense and doesn't create any problems for myself. As I get the path of construction tweaked or adjusted, then I'm going to use that to develop the schedules for my project. And these could be high-level schedules used by the management team. These could be uh, detailed schedules uh, used by the constructor to actually assign crews. And then finally, as we go through the project, we know we're going to run into problems. And as we do, we're going to pull those resources in to resolve those issues. It could be something simple like equipment failures. It could be uh, problems getting um, vendor information. And therefore, uh, we can't execute the work that we wanted to, so we have to execute other work instead. Uh, we're constantly looking back to see if the critical path uh, has changed on us and if we need to reassign resources. But we've got a team of people from different stakeholder groups that can help us with this particular problem. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So when we're looking at our project, we've got the overall project, and then it's going to break down into uh, construction work areas, which are a portion of the, the whole project. And then we're going to have engineering work packages. And these are design elements that are going to outline uh, exactly what we have to build, what standards are going to apply to it, uh, what materials are going to be required to do it. And then we have construction work packages. Now, these construction work packages take all of the engineering information and then add to it how we're going to build it, what manpower is going to be required, what uh, safety issues and quality issues and rigging studies are going to be required to do the work. And then we take it down to the most granular level, uh, installation work packages, which is how we're actually going to uh, build it and instructions given to crews to actually do the work. Uh, Next slide, please. So we'll start off looking at the project as a whole. And uh, I want you to think of the project as being either an oil and gas project, a power project, a chemical project, or a uh, Um, or a uh, large chemical project like an airport or a hospital. Um, we're going to have the entire project, but then we're going to want to zoom in to a specific portion of it. Next slide. Um, okay, so for example, on any of those projects that we just talked about, there'd be a need for water. So let's assume that a portion of the project is going to involve a water pumping station. Um, that water pumping station is uh, 
going to be critical to the overall project. Um, it's going to involve multiple disciplines because we're going to have to have civil, we're going to have to have steel, we're going to have to have pipe in order to build it. So construction work areas are multidisciplinary. Next slide. Okay, so when we start looking at uh, the engineering work package, this is really a design tool. Uh, the engineering work package has all of the engineering drawings that show how this is going to be structured. Uh, it also includes all of the information on the materials required to build it. Uh, it's going to include uh, details on uh, how the specifications are going to roll out, how this needs to be built, uh, and basically it has to be designed by system. So if I'm putting together um, the water system, we're going to see that they'll go throughout the entire project. Now later on we can start carving it up and saying, well, wh what are the ones that relate just to the pumping station? But when the engineers are designing it, they have to look at the whole system. Now one of the challenges that we're having with this is uh, while the engineers need to design it, by the entire system, the constructors want to have the material at certain times so that they can build it. So you've got construction wanting only parts of the information and the engineers trying to design it as a larger uh, system. Next slide. So when we get to the construction work package, this is a different uh, document than the engineering work package. The engineering work package talks about what do we need in that system, what are the drawings, uh, but when we get to construction work package we're now thinking of how many people do we need to build this? What are the quality requirements? What are the safety requirements? Um, how do we get that stuff in place? So rigging studies. Uh, so we're going to find that the uh, CWP is a, a much more detailed document and uh, one of the things that might be helpful to you is in the RT272 uh, volume 2 which is the implementation guide it actually gives samples of what you would find in a CWP and uh, there's 21 different elements in a CWP and there's a template available within that uh, particular document. Uh, engineering work packages have fewer elements and they're also discussed in RT272. Uh, you can get those from the Construction Industry Institute. If you're a member, uh, they're free. If you're not a member, you have to pay for them. Um, but one thing I would suggest is uh, this is what we do, this is the only thing we do. If you want additional information or you want specific examples of something, please contact us after the webinar and we'd be more than happy to help you with that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we take these construction work packages which are single discipline usually and which uh, involve a certain area of the facility and then we break that down into smaller packages called installation work packages. Now these are crew level packages that we can give to uh, specific disciplines and say we want you to go in and install this pipe. We want you to go in and erect this steel. We want you to go in and uh, grade this uh, civil work. And the information that's provided to uh, these crews is extremely detailed. It uh, lets them know what materials they're going to require, what work steps are going to be required, uh, how they're going to actually do the work. And if you think about it, when somebody is trying to do typical construction, uh, you know, renovation in your basement, the actual work isn't that hard making sure you got all the materials, all the equipment, all the permits, everything you need to do the work, that's critical. 
and if we're missing any of those things it's going to cause delays it's going to cause confusion and we want to make sure that we know that the work that other groups were supposed to do has actually been completed before we send a crew out to do the work so it doesn't do me much good to send a crew out to a wreck pipe if the steel isn't up yet so there's a, a lot of coordination that's required to make this work next slide okay so uh, I want you to take a look at the uh, constraint satisfaction so when I put together a package in the package there's going to be engineering I want to make sure that that engineering information that's going to the crews has no holds on it that everything is actually executable I also want to make sure that they have the right materials and those could be tagged items uh, things that are specifically identified those could be bulk items but they have to have all the materials they need to do the build we also want to make sure that the scaffolding has been not only identified but that it's actually been done as effectively as possible on some projects we can see that 40 percent of the expenditure is actually on scaffolding now that's temporary structures that aren't even going to be around once the once the system is built and as a result we want to make sure that we're not building it and tearing it down and building it and tearing it down but that we're actually coordinating across multiple disciplines to make sure that we build it as efficiently as possible that we only modify what scaffolding is required as opposed to tearing it down and starting over also there's going to be equipment requirements uh, do we have the necessary cranes to do the work are they in place are they going to be in place in time to actually execute that work are there any specialty tools that are going to be necessary to carry out the work and will we be able to do that work if we don't have those tools so we want to make sure that any of the items that are going to cause us problems are actually going to either be in place or are in place when we're doing the work now we talked about uh, predecessor work a few minutes ago but I have to know the steel is going to be up and available for use before I send my piping people out to actually put the piping in place it sounds like a simple matter to make sure that predecessor work has been done but on a large project that actually can be quite challenging so we have to make sure that the work is complete and that it's been signed off prior to the next discipline showing up uh, documentation uh, do we have all the documentation necessary to start executing the work before we send crews out to do it uh, do we have a really good understanding of what the quality requirements are and have all the proper tests been done and is safety built in properly to the packages um, we've seen some huge improvements in safety but uh, those improvements are basically because of improved communication and so we want to make sure that the documentation around safety and around quality is crystal clear next slide so the question then becomes well, where where can we apply this um, as I said initially it was the oil and gas sector that took up uh, advanced work packaging but then we found that chemical sector, uh, the power industry, government infrastructure, um, they all started seeing value in this and started using it. And uh, for large commercial projects like hospitals, airports, convention centers, they also uh, saw value in this more detailed level of planning. And, and you could think of it not as a new way of doing things, but just as a very systematic, disciplined approach to doing it. Um, there are projects going on all around the world that are using this approach and I'll show you a map of that uh, shortly next slide so if this system is so much better um, what challenges will we have in trying to implement it um, well probably the biggest one is underestimating how difficult 
the implementation challenge will be. You know, there's an assumption that if this is better than what we're doing now, everybody should just adopt it and it'll go great. Well, the problem with that is the people who are currently managing projects got there because they knew how to manage traditionally. And as we change how you're going to manage the project, there's a tendency for people to say, well, I already know how to do this. I don't want to learn a new way. I don't want to do it a different way. I might not be able to do it as well. So I'm going to stick with my old approach uh, until you can prove to me this is better. And you better support me through that process. You better train me. You better give me the tools I need to be effective. And the next part of that is m making sure you have senior and project management support. You know, often what I hear when I'm dealing with uh, presidents, vice presidents is, okay, well, you've got our support, uh, so, you know, now it's just up to the teams to actually do it. That's not enough. If you do not have senior management and project management actively indicating that this is how they want it done and showing through their actions that they support this, you will have problems with implementation. Another issue you're going to run into is we're trying to get alignment between construction, engineering, and procurement. And basically what we're saying is construction is going to say this is how we want to do it, and then engineering and procurement have to support that. It's often underestimated how difficult it will be to get the engineering and the procurement group to make slight alterations in how they do things because the assumption is, well, you know, the, getting the support for construction will be easy. The reality is that construction uh, is not used to having the ability to say, this is when I want this, and this is when I want that. And it's not construction telling, it's construction working with engineering and working with procurement to come up with something that's going to work for everybody, but is based on that path of construction. Next slide. So one of the things that tends to happen is as we put in these new processes and new systems, there's going to be some changes to how engineering works, how the supply chain works, how project controls work. And one of the errors that we often see is uh, there is not an effort made to change those existing processes. Um, we either add to them, which creates more work and problems that way, or we just assume that the existing processes will work for us. And we know that that's not true. Uh, we're not saying there's huge changes, but where there are changes required, we need to have them captured in policies and procedures. Um, the other issue is that we may be creating brand new processes for an organization, and we have to make sure that those processes are, again, documented and that everybody is trained in them so they understand what it is that they're being asked to do and the interrelationship with other parts of the organization. Um, the next thing we find is that often there's no checking for compliance. And what we mean by that is uh, we put a new system in place, people are trained to do it, are they actually following those procedures? Now when it comes to safety, when it comes to quality, we do this routinely. But if we're going to make this stick, we need to make sure that we're doing that kind of compliance checking for advanced work packaging. The other thing is we have a number of people on the line from all over the world. And the way we do things in different countries is slightly different. It could be different for legal reasons. It could be different for cultural reasons. But we have to adapt our systems to make sense for the type of project we're doing and the location we're doing. And often where organizations don't do that, they run into problems. They come up with a system that makes perfect sense for North America, but then when they do a project in India, it doesn't quite fit. So again, this is something I hope we can talk about during the Q&A. Next slide. When advanced work packaging was developed, 
there was something created called a maturity model and it's available in the RT272 document. It, it's a very simple two-page document to tell you where am I in the maturity of my AWP system. And there's three levels, uh, early stages, which is basically where everybody starts out, AWP effectiveness, and that's where we're doing a number of the elements, but not necessarily everything, and AWP transformation, and that's where uh, we're we're seeing that it's just how we do business. It's uh, it's culturally embedded at that point. And there was a study done through the University of Texas at Austin to look at a number of projects that were in the three levels of maturity and then assess what their performance was. So next slide, please. You can see here that when a project is at the first level of maturity, uh, these are the results that they get. And they looked at performance in terms of productivity, cost, safety, schedule, predictability, and quality. And they established where those particular projects fell out in terms of those six indicators. Now, if we look at the next level, uh, next slide please, we see that as you move to a more mature system, all of the performance indicators improve. Productivity goes up, cost containment gets better, safety improves, uh, schedule improves, predictability improves, quality improves. So by moving from the first level of maturity to the second level, we see improvements in all of the performance indicators. Next slide. When we move from the second level of performance, effectiveness, to the third level, business transformation, we see that all of the levels either stay or improve. And the two levels that continue to improve are quality and predictability. So when we move from effectiveness, which is pretty darn good, to business transformation, the two areas that we see additional improvements in are quality and predictability. Now, all of this is fine, but you're probably saying, yeah, but how much did it change things? Next slide, please. Well, uh, these are the improvements that we're seeing. Uh, now, a TRIF rate is a total recorded incident frequency rate, and it's basically uh, related to safety and it's related to people being um, injured. And we've seen on projects with millions of man hours, TRIF rates of zero, which was unheard of 10 years ago. Um, and that's been attributed to the use of advanced work packaging. We've seen productivity of labor improved by 25 percent and that's well documented now and we've seen total installed costs improve by 10 percent. Um, this is all available in the RT319 documentation. We've also seen that the uh, we've also seen that the uh, rework has been reduced, that schedules have been improved and predictability has been improved. And, you know, just from a personal note, we did a project in um, 200 miles from the Arctic Center, and uh, they kept going back to the uh, senior management team and changing their prediction as to when things were going to be done and where they were. Uh, we got brought in as consultants to support them, and we were able to give them accurate information. It, it wasn't necessarily what they wanted to have to tell management, but it was accurate now. So predictability is one of the things that's really critical. As a project manager, I don't ever want to have to go back to the management team multiple times with different statements about what's happening. Uh, whether it's good or whether it's bad, you want to tell them this is where we are and you want it to be accurate. Next slide. Now, there was a project that was done in, uh, uh, in the Middle East by uh, 
a joint venture between Dow and Saudi Aramco. Uh, and this was uh, what's called a Giga project. It's actually a $20 billion project. And uh, they actually brought in the project director to talk about the project at the last uh, Construction Industry Institute conference. And at that conference, they indicated that uh, according to IPA, 80% of giga projects end up 100% over budget. So what that means is if you've got a $20 billion project, there's an 80% chance it's going to turn into a $40 billion project. That's not great news, but that's, that's how it works. Um, with the Sadara project, the project team reviewed seven, the 17 CII best practices and then decided to apply all of them that they could to the project and that included advanced work packaging. At the end of the project they were under budget, ahead of schedule and the part that's really uh, impressive to me is that their safety record was a hundred, hundred times better than normal. Uh, TRIF rate of 30 is normal in the construction industry. A TRIF rate of 3 is normal for typical CII projects. The Sadara project had a TRIF rate of 0.3. So it was 100 times safer. And I think that's what we, we want to do. By using a systematic, structured approach, we want to get better performance. Next slide. So advanced work packaging may have started in North America, but it's actually been expanded to the world. Uh, there are projects in Australia, in uh, the Middle East, in South America, uh, frankly all over the world that are using some form of advanced work packaging. But uh, uh, basically what you'll find is uh, it's now being used in North America, South America, Australia, um, Brazil, uh, Europe, and uh, uh, China. Uh, it's pretty much harder to identify where it's not being used than to identify where it is being used. Um, okay, so... Um... What we're going to do is we're just going to take a minute to sort, uh, look through the questions. There's a lot of questions that came in, and Lloyd's going to pick some of the some of the ones that stand out, and he's going to try to his best to answer them. So let's just take a pause. Okay, so um, Marion's asked what books there are on this matter, and uh, the best resources are um, there's. There's four books that came out of the RT series. There's uh, the first one, RT272 Volume 1, which is the model itself. RT2 Volume 2, which is the uh, implementation guide, and that's a really critical one. There's lots of good templates and flowcharts there. RT272 Volume 3, which is case studies associated with advanced work packaging. And then there's an RT272, sorry, RS272, which is a research summary. And it's a very short document, but it highlights everything that we know about advanced work packaging. Um, there's one other document that could be useful to you, and that's RT319. And that's the validation study. It was the one that actually caused advanced work packaging to move from a uh, recommended practice to a best practice. Okay, uh, next question. Um, and I'm looking at... Uh, okay, uh, so one of the questions is from and I apologize for mispronouncing your name, but uh, um, Balaji, uh, he's asking uh, about modulization and uh, how that relates to advanced work packaging. Uh, uh, 
modulization is absolutely considered when doing advanced work packaging. It falls under the area of constructability uh, and uh, we are uh, making decisions as to the best way to build the facility. Uh, in Alberta, uh, we have uh, small modules and we have larger modules that we can put into a facility and uh, uh, when we were importing modules from the states, because of the transportation issues, we actually had to have smaller modules that we would build into bigger modules on site. Uh, when, when capacity at the module yard started to open up, questions then became, well, do we uh, now go with a larger module that we can build in Alberta, or do we still take the modules that are uh, being built in the states, move them into the facilities that we're going to be uh, uh, creating and, uh, uh, you know, what's the better approach? And a business case had to be analyzed to determine uh, whether it made sense to switch modules and that tied into things like the contracts that have been signed, uh, any penalties that would be uh, incurred if they didn't continue with the uh, multiple smaller modules and uh, what it would cost to do do the redesign of the engineering to reflect larger modules. So this is very fluid. As we go through the project we have to um, we have to consider uh, not only what makes sense when we first plan it but as we start to execute. Okay. Um, why hasn't advanced work packaging been applied to other uh, sectors like technology? And that's from Ant Antonio. Uh, I think the biggest reason why it hasn't been applied to other uh, sectors is because the model was only approved in 2015. So we're starting to see it expanded to other industries, other disciplines, and uh, I think you will start to see it being applied uh, more in the technology sector. Okay, uh, another question that we've got is from Vesanthian. Uh, he's asking, uh, since most of the project construction uh, will be awarded to subcontractors during the procurement stage of the project, how will it be used on mega projects? Um, one of the things that we've found is uh, companies that are trying to implement this often don't consider uh, early enough how this is going to change their contracting strategy and their contracts. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, can the companies do this? So that gets into vendor pre-qualification. What are we requesting of them? That gets into the contracts that we actually develop. Um, what type of contracting strategy is this? Is it a lump sum? Is it cost reimbursable? If it's cost reimbursable, it's pretty simple um, because the owner's going to pay for it anyway. And if we haven't specified it early enough, um, it's just going to be extra cost for the uh, owner but it's pretty easy to implement. If it's lump sum and we've signed a contract with somebody, they're going to view this as a change order. It's going to cost more money. Um, that, that may not be a bad thing but it's just a reality that we have to realize that as this uh, gets implemented, uh, change orders cost people more money. Um, interesting question. Uh, Servinus uh, has indicate uh, has asked the question: Are we guaranteed greater success using advanced work packaging? And I think the short answer is no. Uh, if you take a look at that maturity model, you see that organizations that are just starting this out are not going to be as effective. And as a result, the benefits that they'll get from advanced work packaging will be less or maybe even non-existent. Um, but as they build their mastery in using advanced work packaging, they will find 
that they get better results. Um, one of the clients we had was working on uh, a power plant. It was a half a billion dollars, and uh, uh, it was their very first attempt at doing it. Policies were written, procedures were written, um, but they really didn't buy into the concept the way they needed to, and they didn't get the benefits that they were expecting to get because of that. Now, will they get them on the second or third or fourth project? I believe they will, but that's part of the learning curve. Okay, uh, we're at five minutes left, so I think we'll just take a couple more questions. Um, and uh, let me just see, I've got a lot of questions going here, so I'm trying to get one. Yeah, uh, one of the questions we had is, can we tailor these work packages based on the project? And I think the uh, answer to that is we kind of have to. Uh, depending on how you've decided you're going to build this, uh, the level of modularization you're using, um, it could look quite different. And, and let me give you an example. I've said that typically construction work packages are single discipline. Um, but if we're talking about a heavily modulized project, uh, a module work package tends to be multidiscipline. Uh, we want to improve the efficiency of building that particular module, and module shops want to know not just about how the pipe's going to look or how the steel's going to look, but how the whole structure's going to look. So as a result, a module work package will tend to always be multidisciplinary, whereas a package for stick building is going to be uh, much more uh, single discipline based. Okay, let me, uh, let me pull up one more question. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for uh, their understanding with some of the technical issues that we ran into. Um, Oh, interesting. One of the questions uh, that was asked was, who certifies you for the AWP maturity model? And there's really two ways of doing this. The, the first way that everybody should do it is a self-assessment. So you want to, whether it's a subcontractor, whether you're an owner, you want to go through, read over the maturity model, and then self-assess where you are. Um, but then the second level is to bring in... Um, resources, and those could be from an owner, from a contractor, they could be an independent consultant like myself, to give you a, a, an independent view of where you're sitting right now. Uh, we frequently get asked by um, multinational companies to come in and take a look at where they are and then uh, give them a, a, an independent second opinion. And one of the things that uh, can be quite helpful is to actually uh, talk to the management team in detail because it may be that in certain areas you're very, very good and in other areas you still need to do some work. So we could be very strong in procurement but have challenges in other areas of the project. Okay, I believe that we are uh, just about out of time. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, finish off with a couple of things. Uh, one, if you want to uh, send me questions or if you have anything in particular that we didn't get a chance to cover during this session, please go to our website, groupasi.com, and you can send us an email. And the email will go to info at groupasi.com. We also have a networking group that we've set up called AWP and WFP Networking Group, and we would encourage you to join that. Um, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to be here, and uh, uh, I don't think there's anything else on my end. We're uh, now one minute away from uh, the hour that we promised you. so. I'll just thank everybody for attending, and uh, if you have any questions, please send me an email. I'm pretty good at getting back to people, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing you, hearing from you. Bye now.